But and also, uh, what about the other side? Like, uh, since you're reading, Mala also reading Malayalam literature, either in translation or in translation, like, I read very Malayalam. slowly in Malayalam. Okay. I went to Kerala school in Delhi. Um, my first year of schooling, which was nursery, then long gap. Then I went to Kerala for two years when I was about seven and eight and only spoke Malayalam and nothing else and I was very fluent. And then I lost everything and then restarted again when I was about 12 in Kerala school in New Delhi again. So this thing with Malayalam has always been, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I keep getting exiled from it and then coming back to it and each time I'm less and less of a person and less and less capable. You know, if your language is who you are, and if you have very poor language, then you're quite poor. Mm -hmm. So at one point, I really didn't hear or speak Malayalam for about 20 years, from like, let's say my um, mid-teens to my mid-30s. And then in my mid-30s, I started writing. So maybe because Malayalam was so important when I was a child, because it was my first language, at least briefly for a few years, I went back and tried to find everything I could find in Malayalam mm -hmm. that was available to me in English, all the literature I could find. And I did, there was about a year where I just read. Um, mm -hmm. But I haven't in a long time now. I felt like I knew the people in that place and that if I could see them again through their writing about themselves, it would be a way for me to know myself. I felt like I couldn't really be a writer till I figured out how I might have been a person who, who lived in Kerala and wrote in Malayalam. Because some part of my brain or my makeup was left behind there and I kind of had to bring it back into English. Because when I stopped hearing Malayalam, I also stopped having access to um, the language as a way of seeing myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So if the language was a mirror in which I could see myself, then I stopped seeing myself and then I started seeing myself in another mirror which has another cast to it mm -hmm. and shows me another part of me. So, I mean, there aren't... The more elaborate the metaphors get, the more I'm unable to communicate what I'm trying to say here. Mm -hmm. um, so, it was just a very essential exercise. Yeah, but did, did it's a brilliant reading, literature, so... Yeah. So, did reading essential. that again, like, inform because We've, we've had so many English writers who have been bilingual writers mm -hmm. in India and it's not just about those who write in English, even those yeah. who write in Indian languages yeah. can write in I think foreign. my bilingual self, even if it's been a, a poor self in the two other languages I really speak, which are Malayalam and Hindi, um, is nevertheless a bilingual self. Yeah. And uh, if anything, maybe I have a sympathy for not being super literate or super well read because I'm super unread and super illiterate in mm. two other languages. So whatever mastery I have over my first language, I have a certain sensibility that comes from my poverty in other languages. Um, as for other than my sensitivity or sympathy or politics around these questions, how my craft is shaped by the languages that I have access to beyond English, um, it's mainly about syntax, I think. It's not about vocabulary or images or um, even things that have been done in literature. I mean, Malayalam, you asked me about my endings. Malayalam uh, literature has the most abrupt free fall endings in, in the world. Um, I, I'm not really, I'm not enough of a scholar uh, or not at all a scholar, so I, I only got my own sort of um, half-cracked opinions or um, theories for why this might be. Um, but if you read a, a Paul Zakaria mm -hmm. short story, yeah. it's like, whoa, what just happened? The story ended? How? Why? You know, there's no rules here that I recognize. So they apparently have their own internal logic that they subscribe to, which in itself, like anybody who's bilingual or bicultural, you understand there's more than one way of being, mm -hmm. which gives you great freedom to be even the singular thing that you are, mm -hmm. because you understand there's alternatives, there's alternatives, you know? Um, it's not about right or wrong, you stop fussing over being yeah. correct and right. Mm -hmm. So syntax has been really important to me in my writing because I write in English but I, about people who, who don't live in English. Mm -hmm. And the stories, often even the middle and upper class people in my stories really are speaking Hindi or Malayalam mm -hmm. 
or some other language and I'm rendering the story in, in English. English. So my access, uh, especially as I've become conscious of it, of these other languages, not just as a pileup of vocabulary, but as a way of coding thinking, mm -hmm. their, their syntax is something I can exploit within English. And I love English because it's very malleable. I don't yeah. have enough of a mastery of other languages to know if some others are equally malleable, but English is phenomenally malleable. You can just you can just turn the sentences every every which way, and it'll still um, it'll still have a coherence to it, so that you can actually um, probably one of the highest compliments I've ever been paid is someone in Kerala reading my second book, which was a novel, half of which is set in Kerala, all of it is written in English. So the Malayalam half is rendered in English, said to me that she didn't realize she was in English, that she heard it in Malayalam in her head. And it wasn't just the idiomatic phrases that I sometimes clunkily and sometimes more poetically were able to carry into English from Malayalam. It was also, I think, that I tried to go to the coding of Malayalam, mm -hmm. um, which is coded in my brain. So as soon as I'm writing English in Malayalam or Malayalam in English, I'm adopting the second code. Mm -hmm. okay. I really love sure. this quote, uh, this uh, line that you write in your essay. Uh, in a polar polarized world outside literature, the search for truth is about the business of one truth demolishing another. It is precisely because fiction is not in the business of truth, or at least not in the business of the one truth, that it achieves its paradoxical freedom to hold on to multiple truths. And so, so, so much because you don't, you're not, uh, like, no one is going to uh, question you about, did this character at this time in Chirag Delhi think this? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have, you know, you're not answerable to that. From this class, did he think it in English? Of course mm -hmm. he could. Mm -hmm. I mean, or or someone else could mm -hmm. in that space. So, because you're working with fiction and not say non-fiction, etc., where so much of these characters, like the, say the working class, you will find reports of the working class in a in a in, a, in an academic report, in a social like anthropological report or a ethnographic report or in in a, in a daily newspaper report. But because you work with fiction, and you don't have to find, uh, you know, you, you don't have to cite your sources, mm -hmm. and where you yeah. come this, where you Yeah. So, so I, I feel that the, ma the malleability of the language has also, do you, would you agree that it's got something to do with the malleability of the form of the fiction, where you have, you don't have to justify, uh, except that if it's, well, if it's not well done. Yeah, um, yeah, in, in, in that exchange between the writer and the story, and the story and the reader, and then the writer and the reader, um, things uh, can exist through agreement. Mm -hmm. And it's only when we come to the uh, end of the line, and now it's the reader talking directly to the writer, a la uh, the festival circuit, that you sometimes have breakdown. Um, like the reader will say, no, that character in Chirag Dili could not have had that thought, that was your thought. Mm -hmm. And my answer to that has always been, yes, of course it's my thought, I wrote it, you mm -hmm. know, and I don't actually have like some sort of um, machine that puts me inside people's heads. Mm -hmm. um, all I have is fiction, that's my machine. Mm -hmm. And you have to agree to also enter the machine, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, so I had that funny conversation. I was at Jamia at this seminar thing and somebody said exactly that. She said, but this is completely unbelievable. These are all your thoughts. But the other thing I would say, other than you need to enter the machine, is to the, to the critic, um, uh, I mean, barring the fact that maybe I just did a bad job and couldn't transport the person. Um, she wanted to enter the machine, but my door was too small or something. But <laughs> barring that thought, uh, the other thing I would say to the reader is, how do you know? I mean, how do you know if you won't go there with me, you know? I don't know till I go there. How do you know that uh, what I have thought is not a thought somebody else could have thought? Let's try it out and then see if it works, you know? So. Fiction is, I think, um, 
fiction presents itself as plausible and we engage with it as plausible and sometimes we want to puncture that plausibility to remind ourselves that we are in fiction, that it is a machine, that it's a man-made object, that it has doors and windows and, you know, sort of knobs and whistles. Um, I get that point that you're trying to make. Okay. That it's, it's like a two-way interaction, absolutely. Yes. Yes. It's, it's never you and your story, but there's yes. also the next step after that. Yeah. I, I do wish yes. that instead of writers um, talking to readers uh, outside of their stories, I wish readers, like right now, the present marketing model for writing requires the writer to go mm -hmm. and write and then to talk about their writing. Mm -hmm. I do wish that was not happening. I wish that um, writers would do their talking through their writing mm -hmm. and that readers would do their talking through their reading mm -hmm. and that readers were talking to each other instead, to one another instead. Mm -hmm. So this, this thing right now is not serving literature very well. Okay. This thing where we are um, doing what I'm doing right now. I mean, to a degree, we, I've... See, yeah. for years and years I read and I had no access to the writers. I, yeah. I did... Yeah. I did not for the first 25 years of my life ever know much more about, I mean, I, I discovered those Everyman editions, they were mm -hmm. wonderful, like yeah. you could read Jane Eyre yeah. and then you could see her biography yeah. and uh, uh, you could go read, uh, many, many years later I read her biography, I can't remember the English writer who wrote, um, uh, Charlotte Bronte, mm -hmm. um, but I read it without aid of those things, yeah. yeah, they came much later. Yeah. Outside of the internet yeah. and outside Yeah, of that's not necessarily a pure or correct way of reading literature, but it is a viable way of reading literature which has much to be valued in it. And it, it involved much more adventurousness, mm -hmm. adventures, a more adventurous spirit on the part of the reader mm -hmm. than we allow ourselves to have now. Mm -hmm. This constant questioning of plausibility or implausibility. Either way, I think um, we're too driven in this direction of mm -hmm. prove to me, you know. Yeah, and which is almost like a mathematical equation, and you can't have that in the space of literature. I mean, I understand that if it suits it suits well for other sciences, maybe, mm -hmm. but I don't think it suits well for literature. Finally, uh, my question and promise is my last. Uh, uh, what do you, I mean, there are good books written by Indians and there are average and mediocre books written by Indians in English and uh, there is of, of course a certain politics as far as publishing is concerned and which books get read and which don't. Sure. But, uh, do, but we do still have good literary titles coming up. I mean, yes. So, but do you think that even though there, this is there, do you, do you think that the discourse around literature, see, in the form of reviews, in the form of responses to books, in the form of educational establishments in India, universities in India, responding to contemporary writers, do you think there's a disparity between the two? Um, between the reviewing culture and the writing culture? No, they're both equally thin. I don't know. I okay. mean, there's so little, it's so paltry at every end of the um, spectrum or pic every part of the picture is quite then it's, it's like, you know, the connect the dots game or something when you're kids and there's, there's, say, say you have a connect the dots game in which there's a million dots and, you know, they're numbered or whatever. You have some sense of something there that the same image, if you were trying to render with very few dots, it could go any which way. And I, I mean, I don't, the, the, We are, I think, simultaneously quite thin, and if not for the regional languages that inform us, or the wider world of literature from which mm -hmm. um, we write and to which we belong, I think we'd almost not be worth our existence. Mm -hmm. uh, the reviewing culture is poor. It's poor in multiple ways. There are too few people engaged in it. It's too much owned by uh, different uh, um, sort of uh, 
you know, interests that are contrary to the interests of literature. Um, most reviews are, are um, too immediately needing to say this is brilliant. Mm. It's not just about the politeness of never, you know, either a book gets reviewed in India and is found to be brilliant or it doesn't get reviewed. Mm. Um, and mostly if it's getting reviewed and being found to be brilliant, uh, it may be brilliant, but mm. most of the time really what's motivating all that is, you know, the publisher made a phone call or a favor mm. was called in or mm. and a lot of criticism of the incestuous nature of the small number of people who know one, one another and so on. Um, I mean, if the planet were down to like a pair of siblings and they needed to repopulate it, are we going to criticize them for being incestuous? <laughs> um, the problem is there aren't enough, when we lose out on reviews that say are more complex, mm -hmm. not that we didn't write damning reviews, I don't care if we don't write damning reviews, I care that we don't write reviews that get into how a book was maybe almost fantastic mm. but really wasn't mm. or you know my pet thing that so many books that need to be written are not being written because there aren't enough people writers readers mm. reviewers engaged in this process so say reviewing a book and saying what would have made this book fantastic is not the writer or the reader, but the other writer who never wrote the book next to it, which would explain to us this book and what its project is. Most of the time we can't understand a book because the books that it's supposed to be sitting next to aren't there. Or perhaps, um, I was speaking to this um, poet um, who said, we were talking about how some books that are being written now will actually be better understood when more books are written later. I found that to be a powerful idea. He was sharing this with me and it made a lot of sense to me suddenly. So just as I wouldn't blame the poverty of Indian literature on the handful of writers who are doing their damn best to write a few books, you know, mm -hmm. maybe like really like r rushing through to write the five books or 20 books they'll write in their lifetime, but certainly not the thousand books that nobody can write in their lifetime, but that need to be written. I would no more blame the handful of reviewers out there or the way. So I think things will get richer and better. More people will enter the process. For more people to enter the process, it's not literature alone that needs to fix itself. It's our society. We have a very unequal society. The act of excluding people from literature is a political act, and we have excluded people from literature. We have an abominable curriculum in the school system. Um, we have no libraries. People don't, people are not allowed to read. How are they going to write? How are they going to review? And, and um, other people sit in closed rooms and uh, shake their heads and scratch their heads and say things like, people aren't writing. And of course, their understanding of who people are is this very narrow slice of the population. They haven't even hesitated to render all these other people non-people by excluding them from the word people. That's the problem with Indian literature. 